This week's teaching challenge features a stand-up comedian and author who came to England and this very school 30 years ago after her family fled Iran. Shabby Corsandi. <laughs> well, when I first arrived uh, at Montpelier School, I didn't speak English. That was the thing I remember the most. And not only did I not speak English, but I didn't realise English was a different language. I thought it was just a series of sounds that the other children were making. I tell you what, I feel incredibly nervous about talking to the children. They're very enthusiastic class, actually. We've had one visitor in a couple of weeks ago who was uh, evacuated during World War II, so I think it'll be an opportunity for them to compare this lady's experience with Shappy's experience of being evacuated from Iran. It's the beginning of Montpelier School's International Week, and Shappy will be making her teaching debut on the subject of refugees with Year 6. Whilst the class wait downstairs, Shappy reveals that she knows the ropes. Oh, I mean, look at that. I mean, imagine, that's just so exciting. They move and everything. But all too soon, it's time for the pre class briefing. I'm so nervous. Now, um, I find children very cute. Am I allowed to pinch their cheeks if I find them particularly scrumptious? Mm. Not unless you want complaints, I don't think. Right. I, don't, I don't think they'd be too happy themselves, but certainly parents. And uh, Have you got any tips for me? I would say just go in there, um, be confident, get them engaged. I would imagine it should be less threatening than standing in front of lots of adults and having to make them laugh. Oh, you'd be um, surprised. I think they'll be an eager audience. OK. So I'm sure you'll be fine. Good luck. Lovely. Thank you. Sam Walker will monitor the lesson from a discreet corner. Hello everybody. Hello. <laughs> I tell you what, I'm giggling because I guess I'm just so excited um, to be here at Montpelier School. Um, some of you might know that I came to Montpelier School myself. Some of you also might know that I'm a stand-up comedian and I'm a writer. So I make my living from the English language. Without the English language, I wouldn't be able to pay my mortgage. And yet, when I first came to Montpelier, I couldn't speak a word of English because I came from another country. And um, I came from Iran. You've all heard of Iran? Yes. yes. Hands up people whose mum and dad or grandparents came from another country. Wow, loads of you. Pretty much all of you. So, Mayan, where are your parents from? Oh, my dad's from Nigeria. Oh, well, lovely. I have very good friends from Nigeria. I have noticed the things that you've been looking at in your work about World War II. And have you, have you read Anne Frank's diary in this class? Extracts. Extracts from the diary. Because I remember when I read Anne Frank's diary, I was about <coughs> 10 or 11 years old. And that's when I realised that the world can be such a, a tough place for people, especially from the country that I came from. I related so much, and I think that really shaped my own view of the world, that, that the, we must always remember and read and talk about cases like Anne Frank, because that still can happen today. And that does happen today. And when <coughs> I came here, we were refugees. And so who can tell me what a refugee is. What's your name? A Razan. What uh, do you think a refugee is? So something, so for example, World War Two. So the um, the children had to move to a different city. They were living in London. They moved to Yorkshire because there was World War Two, and they wanted to make them safe. That's right. Say the evacuees. Evacuees. Yes, yeah. that's that's that, exactly. So anyone like when when it's raining. When it's raining and you might go and stand under a tree, in that moment, you too are a refugee because <coughs> you're seeking refuge from the rain. So from a very basic level, we've all been sought refuge at some point. And Britain is a country, like, like all countries, has had the good fortune of being in a position to be able to look after refugees. Now, when I first came to Britain from Iran, it was because there was a revolution in Iran. Now, who can tell me what a revolution is? Harris. Is it like something bad? It is something bad. 
That's right. And um, a revolution is when the people don't like the leader of a country. And that leader isn't uh, someone that they can vote out democratically. So the people revolt. In Iran, the people wanted to get rid of the king of Iran. And so they had the, a revolution. But the new leaders weren't very tolerant. And my father is a writer. And he wrote things that the government of Iran didn't like. Who can tell me what they can do in countries that are intolerant like that to people who criticize them? It's my friend with the, with the broken arm. I'm so sorry. Could they, like, execute you for, um, um, like, for treason or something? They could execute you. That's, that was, that was the, the, the biggest reason my father decided that perhaps we were better off in Britain. When I was four or five, I wasn't all that aware of the politics that was going on. I was just like, we're in a strange country and I don't know what anybody's talking about. And I wrote a book um, and it's actually called A Beginner's Guide to Acting English. And there's a whole chapter in it about Montpelier School. If ever you were interested, perhaps get your parents to buy it for you for Christmas, whatever you like. Um, <laughs> now, we didn't celebrate Christmas at home. <coughs> And I remember trying to explain to my parents what it was. And my grandmother, whose name was Marda John, came to visit us while I was trying to explain. Can we get a Christmas tree? I asked Maman as she laid the table. You want to bring a tree into the house? What funny things these English people do, my grandmother said. But can we have a tree? We're not Christians, my darling. We don't have Christmas trees. What did that have to do with anything? Oh, please can we, please can we, please can we. So my grandmother decorated our yucca plant for me. She made little silver balls with tin foil and hung them off the leaves. She twisted a few of Baba's pipe cleaners around the stems to make white bows. And as she had no fairy lights, she just stuck an old birthday candle in the soil and lit it. So that was my Christmas tree, just a house plant covered in tinsel but it was still nice because it was still them making an effort to make things the way things were at school put your hands up if you if you don't celebrate Christmas oh lots of you so you don't have trees and does that make you feel left out it doesn't does it because you are able to join in with everything at school and that's the great thing isn't it about being at a school like Montpelier that's so full of people from different backgrounds so you can all learn from each other and, and, and bring different experiences to the classroom. I would like you to write what you imagine it might feel like to go to a place away from your friends, away from your family that's brand new to you, uh, different food, different language and write for me how you imagine that would feel. After an industrious 10 minutes, the class give their impressions of what it would be like to be a refugee. I imagine it would feel very lonely and as if you were in a world of your own. If I had to be taken away from my family and friends, I would really feel lonely because it would be a different experience to talk a different language and eat new food. A lady put down a bowl right in front of me. I peeped into the bowl and saw something so disgusting. It was a brown liquid with big lumps and floating around. A lot different to the rice and chicken that I usually have at home. Lovely, thank you. I'm really curious to know what the dish might be that would have a big brown thing floating <laughs> in the middle of it. Thank you very much. But is it only Britain that looks after refugees? The two countries in the world that look after the most refugees are... Well, is it Australia? Russia? Is it America? It's not America, no. The two countries that have the most refugees is actually Iran and Pakistan. And this comes as a, as a surprise to people, but those two countries actually look after more refugees than any other country, mostly because of the position that they're in, in the world. So, although in this country sometimes it feels like Britain's the only country taking refugees, but actually all countries to an extent uh, do this. Does anyone have any questions they want to ask me? Um, my friend over there, I haven't spoken to you, what's your name? Tomo. Uh, how long did it take you in Montpellier to like 
be a normal student in Montpellier? To feel normal, that's a very, very good question. It <coughs> didn't take me very long. After about a term or two, I, I felt that um, I, I, I was normal. I, I felt at home. Let's have another question. Do you have any jokes? Why did the orange go to the doctors? <laughs> wait for it, wait for it. Because <laughs> it wasn't peeling well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, that's, that's, that's how I... Maha's not impressed by that. She goes, you do this for a living. You must be very poor. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to wrap up. So thank you very, very much for having me today. I've really enjoyed myself. And I know that this week is your international week. And it's been a real pleasure to share a little bit of my story with you. Thank you very much. So how did it feel to be back in the classroom? It was really great. I was nervous. And also I had in my head all the, a plan of, of things to talk about. But once I was in front of the children, I'm afraid I was a little bit of a rabbit in headlights. If you did it again, what would you change then? You said you might have. I think children look to you for structure, yeah. <laughs> really. And structure isn't my strong point. But I tell you what, though, um, I don't think your job and my job is all that different. I think stand-up comedy and teaching is all about confidence and control. I think the biggest difference is that it putting the discussion um, emphasis on the children, just giving them 30 seconds or 20 seconds to kind of share their ideas or and hear other people's ideas, really that builds their confidence in being able to come back to you with ideas that oh, they've generated right. together. So I think if they'd done that... Do I stamp on them too soon? No, I think, I think certainly when I was at school, I was sat there waiting geared with what I had to say. And even if the conversation had moved on, I'd still had that in my head, I want to say this. So it's trying to make sure that the conversation has a cumulative effect and they're building on previous talk, basically. I think the fact that you talked about your personal life, I think children really relate well to that. And I think sometimes as professional teachers, you can be quite scared to let children in and see the more human side and your manner with them. It was really positive, you were praising them constantly. Um, having had this experience, I would definitely come back into a classroom. Yeah, definitely. You're welcome back any time, as long as I don't have to job swap. OK. <laughs> Shappy um, reading parts of her book, um, I found out it was really, for me, like, it's like oh, yeah, that's really cool. Um, I think she could have, like, made us do a bit more group work together because we were kind of, like, put to the spot to answer questions. I enjoyed it that she added um, quite some humour into it and it, made, it entertained us the whole way through. <laughs>